So welcome. My name is Christina Ioannidis. This is the Midlife Reboot, Rebuild, Reconquer tribe. And today we are talking about busting the midlife weight gain myth. Um, just to tell you a little bit about me, I am a, and this is a picture of me with my book as well. Uh, I work as a consultant, a speaker, and an author on transformation and on changing both uh, talent, but also companies. I have called, I have transformed into what I call a midlife muse, navigating multiple as adhevals as a perimenopausal chronic illness sufferer, as well as now a breadwinner and carer. I am on New UK's menopause, uh, uh, New UK, which is a portal dedicated to menopause and all things midlife, uh, their board of advisors, as well as being their menopause diaries contributor. I have worked since 2007 with women and corporations across, across the globe, managing individual and corporate transformations. And I'm also founder of Top of Her Game, a platform enabling women to be on their peak performance which I launched in the UAE and is very much Middle East and Europe focused. And there we go, Christina. I was very, uh, I was very lucky to have been awarded the 100 World of Difference Award by the International Alliance of Women for Women in Washington DC in 2014, which leads me to this beautiful picture, Christina. This is what I looked like last time you saw me in person on the left, right here. This was me, March, 2014, having just come back from uh, Washington. I did a photo shoot with a friend uh, just before I moved out to Dubai. So this is a 41 year old Christina looking, well, if I'm allowed to say looking fabulous. Then what happens, fast forward between 41 to 47 is the picture on the right. The picture on the right is a much heavier Christina. Um, she is practically 83 kilos. Uh, so I had put on about 15 kilos in the space of those years that you see here. I had sleepless nights. I had become um, very stressed, very anxious. And I, okay, it was the beginning of COVID. We had no idea what was going to happen in the next few months. But I think this is a visual representation of what happens to most women when we get to this age. Now this age can be different. For some women, it could start at the age of 35. For some women, it could start at the age of 40 or later. But the point is we change and we don't know why. And we, we uh, become a different person. I lost my confidence. I was depressive. And anyone who knows me knows I have this smile plastered across my face normally. Nicola is smiling because it's very hard to, to upset me. I get upset, Greek style. But I do tend to keep the smile on my face unless you really upset me, which doesn't happen that often. But and this is the reason she's why even been known to say, "I'm so pissed off." <laughs> <laughs> this <is so> annoying. <laughs> Yes, that is me. So, and the reason why I share the before and after is because there is an after. What happened, uh, and this is the story that I was sharing a little bit earlier, what happened in 2020, obviously we all know COVID-19 hit, we all know that COVID uh, changed our lives. This picture was taken in Amman because I was living in the GCC at the time, so in the Gulf countries. And unfortunately, uh, luckily I was in, the, in, in Greece uh, when my parents uh, got COVID. And unfortunately, I lost my mother to the disease in November 2020. It was extremely painful and I have never, ever, ever been through so much trauma in my life, even though I have lost the business and I've had, I've been made redundant twice. The trauma that I went through these two years of 21, end of 21, beginning, uh, end of 20, beginning of 21, I have never relived. And I hope I nobody has to relive it, but... Uh, this is why I am so passionate about educating women that there's stuff that they can do. The reason why I'm giving you a very open and blatant uh, story here and sharing of my story is that this is a picture now of now. So this is today and you can see the date of the 11th of January 2022. This is Christina who is, uh, Christina with a CH, who is uh, 69 kilos, so I lost 15 kilos nearly, 
uh, a completely different woman. Even though I'm older than before, I feel younger. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is, is radically important because it's, it's related to everything I went through. I feel more flexible. I feel more in control of my body. So what happened, what I feel, what I felt in my 40s is that my body was controlling me. Now I feel like my body, I control my body. And I've learned what the levers are for us to be able to control what we seem to have controlling us, if that makes um, sense, which is why it's very important for us to talk about this. And I, there is a cost, by the way, to employers. And this is one very important. And that's why I keep referring back to, my, to the book I wrote with Nicola, because this book is called Boss, How to Win Back Your Female Talent. When we don't look after our female talent and the issues around the talent, there's a cost to the business. In this case, when we look at things like menopause or the symptoms of, because it's not about you know losing your period, it's about the symptoms that go with it. Menopause costs American employers $770 in productivity losses per menopausal woman per year. In extreme cases, it can go up to $6,500 per woman per year. In the UK, 60% of working British women report menopause negatively impacts their work. One in three have taken sick day due to symptoms. And in 2017 reveals that one in 10 women have considered quitting their job due to menopause. What I haven't shared with you until now is, uh, some of you know this, as I've also literally just been about a year ago, diagnosed with a, an autoimmune disorder, which is called endometriosis. And it very often goes undiagnosed for multiple years. And I can tell you, I'm a woman who is very energetic, extremely strong. I used to be a rower as well, which is another thing I share with Nicola as, as is, is our passion for sport and exercise. But two days of my cycle, particularly in those worst years that, that I talked about, 2020, 2019, I had and I have had to spend in bed. I could not peel myself out of my bed because of the pain. There were times when I was traveling the world and those who connected with me on Facebook know this, I would be traveling the world, I would get paid to go to Singapore, to China, to uh, Oman, to the UK. I would travel the world, do trainings. And some of the times I would have to have my husband uh, do the trainings for me because I was incapable of even thinking straight, let alone standing. Now, I am not unique. If I say to you that one in 10, that only 10%, that endometriosis affects 10% of women, but it goes unnoticed, that's a very, very, and undiagnosed, that's a very big number. So this is why I'm passionate about us having to, uh, have, having this opportunity to share some of the learnings. And for me, and this is why I'm, I'm keen to have, so keen and delighted to have Nectaria on, on board, is that when we get to midlife, we very often, uh, thanks for letting us know, Nicola, we very often just think about our hormones and that's it, they're controlling us and there's nothing we can do about it. But there's nothing that's more further from the truth. There is something that's called the hormonal hierarchy, which I'll touch upon after we talk of, we, uh, Nectaria does her magic. But are essentially our sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, are actually controlled and helped to be uh, calibrated by three other hormones. The top one is oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. Anyone who's had children has had a rush of this. And then you have cortisol, which is the hormone, which is, is, is kind of our fight or flight response. It's our stress response. And then we have insulin. Insulin is the hormone that the body secretes, uh, which is all the blood sugars. And so when people become diabetic or have diabetes, they have too much insulin. It's called the insulin resistance. And we pile on weight. I wasn't diabetic. I suspect I was pre-diabetic. I was definitely what's called insulin resistance. So when I tell you I had sleepless nights, that's cortisol. When I put on the weight, I had too much insulin in my body. Too much cortisol also holds on to insulin, which is why we pile on the pounds. And I know that Nectaria is gonna do her magic and explain this to us. 
giving you this introduction here because it's very important. I never knew this. I'm a, I'm a well-read woman. I consider myself to be well-read. I am someone who has always looked after myself, but you saw it. I let myself go because I had absolutely no understanding of, of the levers that we've got available to us, which is why when, ne when Nectaria comes on, which she will be next, uh, we will be talking about the power of using our bodies efficiently and it's, there's a myth. The myth of weight gain can actually be controlled and there are critical levers, two of which she'll refer to tonight, there's many more, but she will refer to exercise and she will be referring to the fueling that goes with it. And I'll come back to add some value, uh, additional value if possible, because she's such a genius and all this stuff. So Nectaria, I'm going to hand over to you um, if you want to unmute yourself, by the way, everyone who's online, feel free to jump in with questions. This isn't a Christina and Nectaria show. This is for you guys to also get involved in, in our conversations. But Nectaria, over to you. Yay. Unmute yourself. I'm happy to slides if you want me to do that. It sounds a little bit um, broken. Your voice sounds a little bit broken, so I'm, I'm a little bit worried. How's your Wi-Fi tonight? Wi-Fi is good. We've got, I'm using my, my mobile, so hopefully it'll be fine. Can everyone else hear me? Can everyone else hear okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine, Christina. Oh, fantastic. Well, Nectaria, because we've got your beautiful picture in front of us. I wasn't thinking the same thing back then. It was so nice to be here, girls. Thank you so much for having me, Christina. It's, it's really nice. And this conversation I want to share tonight is pumps me, makes me very, very excited because it's information that is, you know, relatively new and uh, it's, it's, it needs to be shared urgently. And, you know, we're in midlife now, we are in perimenopause and we still have, you know, chance to get the hang of this uh, so the next generation really gets a good chance with that. So uh, I'm a fitness instructor. I've got a, a national award for best program. Uh, I've got another award for best class in Bristol in Bath. Um, uh, I have got, um, what's the other one? The Happy City Award. Okay, these are my little awards just to let you know uh, I've been uh, teaching for 10 years uh, with women exclusively and I have been mainly a dance fitness instructor which is cardio yes so dancing will be the cardio uh, long story short done my classes all you know all those all those years those 10 the, those first nine years and it looked fantastic and I had a slim body and a flat tummy and I was like ah you know, it's, it's my jeans, it's my jeans. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the picture on the left <laughs> appears in the mirror. I was really, really, really gutted actually, really gutted because I was, I was really, really confused. Exactly like Christina said, I felt like uh, my body let me down. It was out of control. I hadn't changed anything. And if you're an instructor and you're teaching classes and your body is starting to, you know, not look the way it looked a year ago, then you start doubting your program, you start doubting yourself, you feel like you're lazy and what, what, what am I doing wrong, you take it personally, but in reality it's just lack of understanding what's in our body, how it's changing and adapt to it. And there are several different strategies to do uh, and today we're going to be talking about one. Um, question I always get, what's the best, what's the best fitness to do? what's the best exercise to do in perimenopause and beyond and uh you know is it is it weightlifting is it pilates is it yoga is it running and the truth is it's all of those if you place them correctly around your inner compass which is the menstrual cycle it's as simple as that it's as simple as that our menstrual cycle oh there it is thank you christina Menstrual cycle is, is an absolute magic that happens around 400 times in our body in a lifetime. Four, we are born with around 400 eggs and we go through 400 cycles, okay? And it's 
to show with the, the hormones how they go uh, within the, the cycle, starting with um, day one. Day one will be the day we get our period. Yeah, that's the bleed. The day we bleed starts, as you see, week one, let's say. All the hormones are low, all right? Then, you, as you can see, they rise up. The pink one, which is the top one, is the estrogen, okay? That's the one. It picks up into the middle. We've got the ovulation. Yeah, we know what ovulation is. And from then, from then on, it drops. Progesterone takes over. Progesterone is the, the hormone that prepares the gestation, pro-gestation, right? So it prepares the body for pregnancy. So the, the, cha the, the physiology will change, okay? Then we also have the yellow line is the testosterone, okay? So it's always kind of slowly, it hits on around population and then low again. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna be saying the first half of our cycle and the second half of our cycle, okay? Otherwise, we can say the low phase, which is the first phase, you know, and <laughs> the high hormone phase, which is the second one, okay? Let's see. So, physiologically, what happens? We get our periods, all the hormones drop, right? We, I think we all feel it. That's when it's really prevalent and we feel it right we're low in energy we're grumpy i'll tell you what i noticed the other day because i've only just started i'm, bit, I'm greek so i don't i don't shave we don't shave in in, in cyprus we take everything off but i started shaving in the last month so i've been noticing you know i shave every other day i had to shave every other day when i got my period last week the hair wasn't even growing it wasn't growing for a week it just goes to tell how many things are affected. Okay, then all these uh, hormones start raising. No, sorry, not all, the estrogen. And we are kind of starting to feel a little bit more energized, right? It feels a little bit like spring. We're getting back into being ourselves and everything looks optimistic, right? Um, then everything picks our own ovulation. Okay, so uh, what happens there? We, we the, the body is trying to attract a mate. Whether we want to get pregnant or not, whether we want a child or not, this is what this cycle does. So it makes us more um, uh, outgoing, yeah? Uh, even the jawline change. Did you know that the, the pelvis, the ratio, the waist pelvic ratio changes? to make it bigger so it looks more attractive. It's a bit crazy, but these are the physiological changes that happened. And then after ovulation, estrogen drops and progesterone takes over, okay? And that, in that phase, we're gonna start to feel, since we're preparing for potentially a um, pregnancy, we get a little bit more introvert. We, um, um, we find it a little bit hard to sleep, we're a little bit more relaxed, yeah, we feel more cozy, we want to be a little bit more cozy. And then towards the end, week four, for example, everything drops, okay, everything drops. Um, the testosterone, so our yellow line, uh, peaks, peaks around um, the ovulation and that's the, you know, we're feeling really on it, yeah, those are good days to do a big presentation for example yeah that's a good day for that so in terms of fitness because we're going to focus on fitness mostly today what happens is that our body with the project with the estrogen we're going to uh, let's talk about the first phase yeah the, the low hormone phase the first phase the body is good with using carbohydrates and the body is good at that uh, phase to do hard workouts, high intensity intervals, build muscle. Okay, so we need to leverage that, build the muscle and, um, and cardio. And also the body is really, really good at recovery. Okay, because recovery is a very, 
important part of a fitness regime, of a training regime, that's not really, that should be taken into account. Now we need to put more attention on that. Then on the second phase, on the high, I keep say, wanting to say luteal, but Christina is going to tell me off. <laughs> on, the, on the high hormone phase, oh my God, it's not coming out. I'm sorry, girls. Just trying to explain so you get to understand and take this away with you. What happens is that our core temperature rises. So we're going to sweat a lot quicker than if we did the same workout on the first phase. Okay, we also know that progesterone is catabolic. That means that it breaks down the muscle. Okay, so we don't want to be doing really difficult stuff on the second phase because we lose a lot of muscle. We also don't recover well enough. We don't recover well on the second phase. So we need to approach the two phases very, very differently. And in fact, I've broken them into five for the girls that are on my program and I'm pretty strict with that and I'll explain how it goes okay rest and restore will be your first three days once you get your period <laughs> <I'm loving Christina. laughs> so once you get your period you've got to rest end of story pushing and pushing and pushing is, is not going to help. Yeah, we can't go against it. This is what the body wants. The body wants to rest. In fact, there's some tribes uh, where they have the red tents. Has anybody heard of the red tents? When the women get the period, they go into the red tent among with all the other women who have the period. And the kids are being looked after by the rest of the tribe. Isn't it? Yeah, they're it ostracized. Uh, no, no, they are being looked after. No. They oh, are, I see. Yeah, they're being looked after and they're just having girly time in that. Room. I want a red 10. I want a red 10. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Where's so, my red 10? <laughs> so those very, very low hormones kind of really sustain workouts, right? But then we go into what I call the build up phase, which is day. Um, four to seven let's say yeah around four to seven of course it will vary for everybody this is on uh, based on a 28 day textbook type of period the energies are starting to rise yeah the estrogen is rising but it's not time yet to go full in all in high intensity interval heavy lifting we, we can't do that we shouldn't do that because you see, it's still kind of low. So what we do, uh, the ideal workouts of that phase would be body weight training. Yeah, don't give it all in just yet. It's medium, medium weights, maybe small. Yeah, a little run. We listen to the body and we rest well. Then the orange part is the part where everybody feels, you know, that's everybody's favorite phase because we feel like ourselves. Yeah. We have a lot of hormones, we're feeling sexy, we're feeling energetic, we feel we can do everything. And also testosterone is, is in, in as well, flooding. So that is the good time, the good phase of the menstrual cycle to lift heavy. Go heavy, do the high intensity interval trainings. That's why we, I call it high and heavy. High intensity, heavy lifting, okay? We tend to as I said, use glucose really well. So we use carbs really, really well. Um, and we tend to restore a lot better, like recover a lot better. So what we do in that phase, break our muscle, we lift weight, and we all should lift weights from now on. We really, really should. And once you start, you, you love it, you love it. Fuel ourselves really, really well with carbs and with protein, yeah? build the muscle because the next phase comes the green one steady and sweaty when progesterone takes over we just can't push the same we can but i dare you to try the same boot camp say if you go to a boot camp try it on week three and try it on week two and you'll see the difference okay and then and you you think oh, what am i doing wrong oh i'm not on my best tonight no there's nothing wrong with you you're simply on the progesterone phase okay so this is this is the whole idea 
Week four, we're talking about around five to seven days before our get a, we get a period. Um, that's the phase where we really should be listening to our body. What does the body want? It may want more rest than we want to give it because we think we should be pushing all the time. That's a good time to do Pilates, yoga, restorative stuff. Yeah, that's really, really good. And also week three and week four, because we have the progesterone on eating up our muscle, we need to up our, our um, protein. Yeah, lots of protein. And also it's imperative before and after the workout to fuel with carbs. We can't just go in with, you know, faster cardio or, you know, that kind of um, full-on fitness -y stuff. No, we need to fuel and we need to rest more, okay? So more or less, this is how it goes. So in the wind down, we're just waiting then for our period to arrive and we'll go back to day one. So, you know, in summary, week one and two, we're building muscle, yeah, we're building intensity. And then on the third and fourth, we maintain the muscle with medium weights and kind of steady workouts. We don't go up and down, kind of high intensity, steady and sweaty. Another reason why we need to sweat on week three and week four is because we are uh, in perimenopause. As you know, as you may know, if we have too much estrogen and it takes over, if the line of the progesterone goes, sorry, of the estrogen goes over progesterone, so we, we want progesterone to be the dominant uh, hormone in week three and four, right? But if estrogen goes over, then we have estrogen uh, dominance. And that creates a lot of our symptoms of perimenopause. So it's a really good thing to do to sweat it out. Sweat it out, uh, but in a steady way. Steady and sweaty, okay? Like, Maria, can I jump in here? Because uh, mm -hmm. this is, uh, my personal story resonates with this. So the lady that you saw, who was the, the chubby lady on the right hand side, when, when I had my picture, which was me, I was doing, I had no idea, I'm estrogen dominant and I still am. Uh, and I was doing hardcore, high impact cardio, even twice a day, right through my cycle. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I now recognize I wasn't able to shift weight. So not only was I doing the wrong thing, I was estrogen dominant and I wasn't giving my body, I was pushing it and stressing it out more. Yes. And that's why I'm a big fan of everything that you, you talked about. And that's that's how we then become these fat hoarders. And I'm so sorry, because I'm not fat shaming, nothing to do with it. But our <laughs> visceral, our, our abdomen and the, and, the, and the fat that is around our visceral, uh, what do you call it, our, our abdomen, the visceral fat, it tends to also store more estrogen. So not only do we become estrogen dominant, then we get more, because we've got more estrogen receptors. In the it's a cycle. It's, it's a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's why we kind of start growing as opposed to, hold on, I'm working out. <laughs> why is it not working my way? So sorry, I jumped in there. Exactly, exactly. The same thing happened to me. Mm. Yeah, we live in a very very masculine world and the more we open our eyes to it the more angry we get that's one <laughs> it's it's phenomenal it's all um linear it's all linear for me this was a, a, a wake-up call not only because what i was doing wasn't working but because my friends who were in perimenopause um we're like well i'm going to uh, um uh, i've just signed up with such and such influencer who's, who's 25 and i'm thinking why she doesn't understand what you're going through it's, the physiology has changed the mm -hmm. physiology has changed like naturally by by the mere fact that we're aging we're losing muscle we're losing bone so everything has to shift and i'm a great believer on on um you know, I, I am an advocate of, um, uh, but what was, what's it called? Body love? No, no. Uh, what's it called? You just, you just mentioned Christina. <laughs> Did I? Well, I mentioned body shaming. Yeah, what's the opposite? Of fat shaming, but that's not what you're looking for. Self-love? 
Yeah, like body acceptance and all that. Oh, right, yes. But, but in reality, I believe that it's a matter of us not having the information. Mm -hmm. We don't have the information to understand what the body needs. When we, we're comfortable going to Boots and buying a cream that's not for teens. We, we don't buy teenage creams, do we? And also, we don't go buying the creams that are designed for 70-year-olds. No, we go straight for our, you know, for what it's packaging up for our age. But nobody tells us exactly what we need in this phase right now, right? So well, yeah, I found even the doctors don't really know yet because there isn't enough information and I even I went to the GP I know that I've mentioned this I'm just saying it to the people who weren't here before I mean I was at the GP and they told me to go on Weight Watchers which yeah, was ridiculous because I knew what I was putting in my mouth yeah if we may just relax honestly girls because I've seen it now and it's been proven I've worked with this for a year now with all my girls once you understand your cycle and respect it then go with your body, go with the flow. That's why I call it flow, flow fitness, this presentation. Once you go with the body, then it has the time. It has the time to recover. It has the time to give you what it's designed to give you. It's so very important. Enough with the burnout, enough with pushing. All the programs are linear, like linear. Like every day you go to the gym and you're meant men to push hard. And if you don't push hard, you feel like a failure or you feel like you're lazy all the blame is on us but we are cyclical creatures we are cyclical by design and it's a cycle month after month after month after month and i wish i wish i knew that when i was 20 and i could just leverage that because it's powerful you leverage that and now i know for example oh it's, tw it's day 21 i know my energies are gonna drop but suddenly on day 21 phew, i prepare myself it's great. I, t I talk to my kids. Guys, I'm just about to have my period. I'm going to want to watch my own stuff. I'm going to be grumpy. I'm going to want to be served. <laughs> you know, it's, it's powerful. It's empowering. And then it is all natural. Natural. We need to go back into nature, especially us, you know, Western modern women. So thank you for changing the... the slide now Christina so once we learn to go with the flow we can optimize our workouts to go to go with what the body needs and therefore we optimize our results right so if you don't support keep sabotaging your results by pushing hard all the time which is a man's job we don't work like that they're linear we're cyclical it's how it is by design we're avoiding the burnout and avoid the injuries as well I forgot to mention that on the second phase week three and four because we're more bloated, we can't really hold our core very well. We can't hold it very tight, which is why it's not a good idea to be lifting really heavy weights because it's not safe. And the other thing with progesterone is it makes our tendons very uh, flexible. Mm -hmm. Too flexible. Yeah. Okay, so we shouldn't be lifting heavy weights. That's our body. He knows it's designed for it. We, we have evolved like that. And also, of course, if we don't burn out by going with the flow, that means that we support our hormones. Isn't that beautiful? Who doesn't want to support their, their hormone production in this phase? <laughs> yeah. What's in the next slide? I, I, that was the, the four slides we had for you. Oh, no, there's one more. Hello. Is there? There you go. Your favorite words. What? <laughs> Follicular and luteal. Ah! <laughs> no, 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 no. No need, no need. <laughs> so I don't know if you can, if, if it's my connection. I'm, have I frozen? Victoria, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, now I can see the, the, the screen. There you go. You got three points there. Yeah, yeah, so these are kind of my summary. First half of the cycle, we build muscle, we build our intensity, the energies are high. Second part, generally speaking, steady pace, conditioning, pilates, working to preserve the muscle, eating more protein, okay? And no fasting. You can if you want to, but it, it won't be the same. It will be harder. So 
strongly recommend you start tracking your your cycle so what you do where is my as soon as you get your period get your diary and next to each day right day one day two day three so you know when to expect it and on that on you know the next expected day one don't put a party i've done that before no party you know make sure you you know save time for yourself create some space to let the body you know accumulate energy and do what it needs to do during the low phase within the period yes embrace your cyclical nature and focus on variety so it's not yoga every day all through the cycle it's not weightlifting all through the cycle enjoy the variety it's part of in a start start observing your energy levels through the cycle and you start having a lot of aha moments and every month that goes by every cycle that goes by and getting the hang of the cycle cycle tracking and your energy levels and your moves so much aha you will be you wishing you had learned that when you were a girl so here we are that's me that's yes, thank you so much Victoria, for this because and i've got a slide here what i learned the hard way and that's number one here i was always working out doing high intensity stuff was always max was kind of boosting my cortisol all yeah. the time so i was actually as i said hanging on to fat then when i started something called intermittent fasting which is how i lost started losing my weight and i lost it very quickly because i lost it within four months and that's why you see a very different christina however as Nigeria says do not do this in the latter part of the cycle from from day 16 onwards because that also increases cortisol levels which then um holds on and messes up with your hormones and then i mean you did this beautifully one of the things that i found with with my journey because this is not proved by uh, science but this is what the science also says but for me the biggest learning was the impact of the microbiome which is the little bacteria that are in our gut now for someone who is in estrogen estrogen dominant i had no idea that was starting to take something called kefir and uh and eating much more cabbage eating cruciferous vegetables that have a certain um what do you call them ah the fermented products that's the word they help reduce bloating and fuel and, and fluid retention and the more of these happy little bacteria we have in, in our intestines the better our body is and it's improving even i was listening to a podcast today ladies what is fascinating is even our vaginal uh, microbiome has an impact on whether a child will have a good immunity in the future or not. So children who have been born with C-section, apparently, this is science talking, um, they have, because they've come, they haven't gone through the mother's natural tunnel, let's call it, <laughs> and they haven't been exposed to the bacteria that are normally in our uh, sexual organs, they tend to have a lower immunity and are more prone to autoimmune diseases versus the, the children that are born naturally. And that's something that they've seen recently because there's been a boom in C-sections. I don't know if you know this, you know, Victoria Beckham and all those have made it very, very fashionable to have a C-section. But there's been an increase in immune disorders and all sorts of uh, um, asthmas and allergic reactions, etc. Um, anyway, so that's thank you so much, Alex, um, Alexia. I've renamed you Nectaria. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I'll take it <laughs> for this. this. This is very wonderful. Now I have a question. I know that there's probably questions out there. Please, please, please jump in or type them on the chat because we've got women from very different ages here. But I've got a question for you, Nectaria because it's all dandy when your cycle is exactly as it used to be. So when you're 28, I used to be as, as a, you could say a clock to my cycle. Right? Mm -hmm. I was actually on 20, 28, 29 days. I knew exactly when I was gonna get my period. I have no idea whether it's a vaccines or not, but in the last six months, two weeks later, one week later, what do we do in that phase where we're delayed in inverted yeah. commas? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's so tricky. So I had I had a slide on that actually and I thought, oh, there won't be time. 
perimenopause comes and uh, you know our cycles become absolutely erratic. They come, they don't come. One, month, one cycle is 21 days and then it's 35. Some of the cycles are uh, ovulatory cycles and some of them are unovulatory cycles, which means we haven't had a follicle, we haven't had an egg come through. So that makes things a little bit complicated, which is why the sooner we start tracking our cycle, the better, the better. How do we manage with the, with the, with the workouts or placing our workouts around our cycle though? In that case, um, we're gonna st we're gonna make an extra effort to uh, track our ovulation. So one way to do that is to take our uh, basal temperature. So before you get out of bed, you would take your temperature, all right, on the base on the base of the body, aka the vagina. If you not, if you do that every day, then if you are half a cal is it calcium or celsium? Celsium. Calcium. Okay, that <laughs> if it's half a degree up, you've you've ovulated. Oh, Celsius. Oh, right. Yes, yeah, Celsius. Celsius. Sorry, yeah, I mean, yes. calcium. <laughs> <laughs> I am not learning here, am I? Yes. So if it's half a degree higher than than your normal, so from periods, it will be your normal, and then after ovulation, it will be it will go up half a degree. Then you know you have your uh, ovulated, and that means you're in your high level hormones, which means no heavy lifting, no high intensity intervals. But, you know, in perimenopause, we're going to have a lot of cycles where we don't ovulate. And therefore, it could be 21 days, it could be 35. I say to be on the safe side, use medium weights and really, really tune into your body. So one, don't risk going all in with weights. You don't want to risk injury. And um, lost my train of thought. It's called brain fog and brain rose. <laughs> well, while you get while you get your thoughts together, we had a question that I had missed. Judith is asking, "What if you no longer have periods?" We kind of jumped into there, but please, please tackle this one and have okay. a Nino belly. Yes, Judith, you're still a cyclical being. Okay, so what you're gonna do? So for 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 my girls who no longer menstruate we use the lunar cycle which is so similar it's so similar to our menstrual cycle in fact the name indeed the name itself is um taken from the lunar cycle so what you will be doing is follow this protocol but your day one would be new moon okay then the energy builds up as it does in the atmosphere okay and then uh full moon would be your equivalent of full um ovulation high energy that's when you go high okay then you're gonna be going a little bit more um on the moderate yeah moderate and a little bit longer uh, and then you're gonna again tune into your body more closer to the new moon when your moon comes, you just rest for three days. And that really helps the body because we are cyclical, Judith. That really helps the body, you know, accumulate that energy, accumulate, and then you give it all in. <clears throat> so, so for a man, a man to who a man's progress will be linear, it will be going up like that. Oh my, could you see me the other way? It will go like that. For a woman, progress will be like that. Progress, and then you rest, progress, you rest, progress. Okay, so it's slower, but we need it steady. If we follow a cyclical pattern protocol like this one, then the progress will eventually be nice and slow and natural, feminine. Okay, if you don't and you're pushing all the way, you'll probably go full on and then burn out. And that, no, enough, enough of that. We're clever women, we have the information, we should use it. The other thing that's helped me, um is that um, what you realize when you start tuning into your body, because I've not had a period for maybe three years because I've been on some special drugs to suppress my hormones. But what I've found is that um, the more that I get tuned in, the better that I can feel my body and I can really uh, hear it. Mm -hmm. So I, I tune into that. And also um, 
uh, the other thing that I do, and I know I wouldn't advocate this for weight loss necessarily, but I weigh myself every day. And the reason that I do that is because then I see that. And in fact, I could share the, 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 the chart with you, but I actually see that, that wave like this. And, and you do, you retain water when you've got um, a more a female hormone. So even when you're not having a period, your body is still producing a, cyclical, a, 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 um, a cyclical uh, phases. So um, y- you'll see that on the scales, amazingly. I mean, it's not huge because obviously the, the hormone graph that that, that um, Nectaria just showed has things like this. Where once you're, in, I mean, I'm in a chemical menopause, but once you're in an actual menopause, you still have that, but it's just a, a smaller bump. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. I did not hear that. I didn't expect to hear that. That's great. Mm. Christina has a question. Christina Vicini has a question, darling. You had your hand up. Yes, yes, I had my hand up. I have uh, put the questions down also on the chat. So when you're in menopause, some uh, gynecologists recommend uh, hormonal therapy. Is there any impact of uh, that hormonal therapy on the cycle and on the results of the or effectiveness of what we do i'm not a doctor but from what from what i uh, have read i'm very i personally i am pro taking the hormones because Mm. you know we've we've been very much biased by uh, a very faulty uh, research um, and we now know we have really, really good quality hormone replacement, the body identical ones. Yeah. Um, I would personally, you know, recommend that you prepare yourself and we go with your questions. But once you do have it, that doesn't mean you're going to lose your cycle. You just support, it supports it. You'll, you'll take progesterone at one point, you'll get estrogen at, at some point. So it's not like the pill. It's supporting what you're missing. If you had about thyroid, you will be given, you know, thyroxine to support that, the missing hormone. So in my understanding, whilst you get help with extra estrogen, then that would definitely help with your energy levels, with your sleep, you know, which is another reason why we put on weight. If you get your help with sleep and it helps you with your bones, because it's, it's very dangerous not to have estrogen in our body, Mm. Um, then, you know, then you can only get better results in your fitness. And I want women to know that it's a good option not to be afraid of that, but it's a very individualized thing. And, um, I strongly recommend my clients to, you know, fill up the form that I give them and then take it, be prepared to a specialist, not a GP because the GPs only get two hours of training two hours of training that's all and because they don't they're not comfortable giving you any information they get a little bit defensive uh go prepared and yes you will feel better you will support your body so yes your result will be better as well yeah yeah. thank you very much Uh, unfortunately the gynecologists are not any better but that's a different story (laughs) Yeah, Christina, um, we've had we've had arguments over this thing with Nicola and I for hours. A, gy- a lot of gynecologists are very, very un- unnerved still about hormonal therapy. But the biggest challenge is because all the trials have been done on a non-individualized basis, so they give the same dosage to women over 60. This is what the majority of the trials have done. They haven't looked at the the younger women who are actually in the most dangerous phase because, and that's one of the reasons why I've kind of gone full force into this. I saw my mother go from a very, very well healthy beautiful woman to become a shadow of her former self because she went through a terrible menopause she had hysterectomy went straight into menopause tendency, osteoporosis like crazy diabetes to had knee replacement therapy uh, what do you call it, surgery and the poor woman had a terrible quality of life all because at that phase she wasn't looked after and because still doctors don't know what to do i was told i'm on progesterone christina I have been given a certain dosage. It seems to be working, but I don't know if it's working enough, but I feel a lot better. But a, a gynecologist here told me 
you've got periods, forget it, go home, forget progesterone. You cannot stop having a balanced hormonal levels because it impacts everything else in your body, including things like your bone density. Yeah. <laughs> Which frankly is kind of important. I, I tell you, my mother, uh, she's been menopause since her 40s and she's been on a, a hormonal therapy since then. And she's been very healthy, no osteoporosis. She's 86. She has no osteoporosis and she's doing great. In my case, I have gynecologists that uh, say that after 40, 45, statistically, a woman should remove her womb because she doesn't, put, she doesn't have babies anymore. And this is Belgium. So how big wow. can anybody be? And this is really, unfortunately, the reality of the different countries and the di different beliefs that gynecologists are <clears throat> built up with. I, I'm really shocked. So I'm really grateful for your feedback. And also not always you have the same uh, medications or the same awareness uh, in every country. So that uh, it's good that you share this because I'm going to research a little bit more. Um, I wish that we could get a platform across the nations. Yeah. And I think this is a grand swell that is happening, actually. Uh, and I have said this before, so I know Nectaria and Christina have heard me say this before, but we're the, we're the daughters of the burn the bra lot. We went into the workplace thinking that everything was equal and great and realized it wasn't. So we charged up and we, we know how to do that. And now we're in midlife <laughs> and we're not taking this menopause shit lying down. So, um, and I said to Christina, cause we, we went, we both went through medical hell in the last five years. And uh, I've got very, very similar before and after photos to the other guys. And, and I said to her, you know, if, the solution to erectile dysfunction <laughs> was chop your penis off and take the testicles just for good measure because you're not actually having kids anymore uh, then there would suddenly be a lot of research and some medical solutions that didn't involve surgery wouldn't there I think what we have to get across is that just because you can't see it, the impact on the women is as great, if not greater, than that kind of what I just described, which, which, which men would find horrifying. But I tell you what, I believe that men as well have different hormonal cycles. I think that they yes, just they have not uh, explored it enough. So I can see it in the people of my age, men uh, that I have close to in my family. And I can see that there are differences as much as there are testosterone declines, but it isn't cyclical. It's just a straight line. Well, but they I also have estrogen cycles. increase as well. Yeah. That's why they get man boobs and all sorts yeah, of Yeah, they do have estrogen, yeah. That's one I of the know, things that I was laughing at, Nectaria, mm -hmm. because uh, Nicola put a comment um, that Sophie is listening to this and she's surprised we have testosterone. And then Kaya responded, wait till she finds out the men have estrogen. <laughs> Because it is true, they, but they also have the, they have a circadian rhythm as well. They have a, yeah, it's yeah. different. It's a different cycle. That's um, right. And and do we? So thank you for this, Christina. And it's really so one of the things that maybe we could do, uh, maybe. And this is a call to action because we've got people here. Catherine's from South Africa. Kinda Miriam in the UAE. Oslem is in Turkey. Uh, da, da, Judith, you're in the UK. Christina, you're in Germany. Kaya was in Germany as well. Maybe what we need to do is to pull together a simple spreadsheet with the gynecologists that we know are in tune with these messages mm. and are open minded to have these conversations. Because that's what I found super hard. Sounds great. Where who, who understood what was going on with me and was ready, a gynecologist specifically, was ready to have the conversations around hormones. <laughs> <laughs> not just what my girly bits were doing and Thank so maybe this are. is something that we can all do a takeaway of and just really get get down to and we share it between us and we have this and we start building a little bit more momentum because the UK is doing a lot but I don't know what's happening internationally. Christina um, Despo 
I just wanted to share something with everybody on this call, on, on the Zoom call. Um, I went through menopause during um, COVID, but at the same time, I've lost about 12 people that I was very, very close to and loved, oh, and um, two staff as well. Um, one, one of my staff didn't die from COVID, but um, and the other person died from cancer, a young woman. She was 42. So it was a horrific time. And I didn't actually realize I was going through menopause because I'm a pretty strong person. I'm very resilient. Um, I've dealt with a lot in my life as well. Also lost my father, you know, when I was working out the country. So um, I, I just thought it was like I was tired. I was working 16-hour days. It was COVID. Um, I've always had a weight problem, but not to the extent where and I lost a lot of weight. I lost about 50 kilos. And then all of a sudden, this weight started piling on. And of course, you get depressed. And then the sleep. I cannot sleep a single night. I wake up like six times a night. Sometimes I'm awake, I'm awake by four o'clock. And I found myself in a stage where I felt, and I don't know if, if, if any of you feel this, and it's obviously the hormones, um, where you feel like, on the outside, you're completely calm, but on the inside, there's everything going on and you don't know what to start first. And um, and I've always been someone that can multitask. So I had all of this going on inside and I was like, what is going on with me? And I went to see this doctor. His name's Dr. Ryan Penny and he was part of the 100 Wellness Center. He's got his own clinic. And I cannot tell you the difference it made. I have not been on hormone replacement. I just spoke to him. And he started mapping out what I was feeling and how to prioritize and, you know, segmented my corporate life from my personal life. And I found myself crying for almost two hours with this man that I did not know. And I, I do believe that it's very important that sometimes we don't even realize what we're going through. And it's very important to share it with the outside world. And in fact, what I want to do in my company is, is have one to three days for women in menopause, because you do have brain fog, you you start a sentence and you can't actually remember what you've said, but then from the other person's reaction, you can kind of realize what needs to be said. And I think that's very important, how it can really affect your self-esteem and you start doubting yourself. And I think that's the more important point that we need to address. Are we really going through it? What part of that cycle are we in? because it affects people to a different extent. And I think, I'm not sure what the lady's name is. I think Catherine from Germany or Belgium, I'm not sure. Christina, Christina. Christina, Christina. Uh, Christina. I, I haven't done hormone replace, replacement, but what I did do is to calm myself, is take herbal supplements. Mm -hmm. And I found that really helps. I just thought I'd share that too. Thank you, thank you, Despo. Absolutely, you. herbal, really grateful herbal for supplements, um, magnesium, L-tryptophan. Mm -hmm. I personally found L-tryptophan helped me because I was very low in serotonin. Which, by the way, women naturally tend to actually have less than men. We have more dopamine, um, and so which is the kind of the reward hormone. So I found that extremely useful. And, and that the magnesium, I don't know, Despo, if you took magnesium or not, I found that super, super useful on the sleep side, because like you, the, when you're in trauma, that's a very big conversation, because luckily you saw that man, when trauma hits you, it hits you right across the body, it just freezes you. I couldn't get out of bed when my mom had just passed, and I think I disappeared, most of my friends didn't see me for four months, the world's most sociable person became a hermit because and a negative person up to not my smile got erased and that's because of the shock and you're absolutely right that's but we need to be able to have these conversations and understand that it's our body reacting to something normally we just need to know how to deal with it um kinda you've got your no you haven't got a hand up it's the it's the uh the the, the, the uh, whatever you call it the computer thing any any more questions thank you for jumping in there despo any more questions what was it that you said is your supplement um, l-tryptophan L yeah. yes let me uh nicola can you type it for me do you know how to type l-tryptophan for me uh oh okay hold on because this is with l uh, t r i f t t o l dash something there. Oh, I think I got it. L-tryptophan. 
Okay. So that okay. is to support the uptake of serotonin to kind of make you feel better. So my, again, I'm not a doctor like Nectaria. We have to make this disclaimer. These are for your information. You need to have yeah, absolutely. a doctor give you these. But my yeah. gynecologist, after I did my my works, my blood works, which were hormonal and she included serotonin and she included cortisol, insulin, all the stuff that we've talked about. Um, she saw that I had was very low in serotonin. Immediately she said, take magnesium uh, and take this L-tryptophan and eat loads of cruciferous vegetables, you know, Brussels sprouts, um, arugula, all this kind of stuff that, and fermented products, like I said to you earlier about things like uh, that help the microbiome. All that stuff is very important. I, I, I had no idea that I could turn a corner so quickly and this doctor saved take? my life. So when I went to see her, so last April was when I had a terrible, terrible case of my endometriosis flaring and I had a very painful period with 10 days of continued back pain after my period had ended. So I go see a gynecologist who's the man who told me that I'm okay. And I went, I left his office furious and it wasn't my hormones <clears throat> talking. So I saw this woman in June. So she gave me those supplements in June to take in June by September, October, I felt a lot better. So it takes a while for these things to kick in, but I wasn't doing just that, Christina. And that's one of the reasons why we're having this conversation yeah. with Victoria, because I was doing that. I was doing the fasting. I was doing all the possible supplements you can take. Another important one is, is for, I was, I was, I have hypothyroidism. So I don't have uh, my thyroid doesn't work as well. So I was told to take selenium. So I was taking that. So there's lots of stuff that I was taking, but all together, I think the, the moment I could sleep better was a moment I had that fog <laughs> kind of lift. You know, there was a visual, physical, I'm alive. Well, the other, the other question I had about uh, indeed starting a protein diet. So I'm followed by uh, a dietitian. At least I used to, so it went very well a few years ago, and now I should really get back uh, on track. So I would like to combine the physical exercise together with a healthier diet and something that also is going to boost my metabolism a little. Mm -hmm. um, so when is the right time, uh, according to the cycle, you think, of starting with that? Because it requires, for instance, two weeks, very strict in, on protein, and then build up with the carbs and other sugars. What do you think about that? Shall I answer it? Yes, please, because I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I'm not the cycle expert. <laughs> I'm not a diet person. I, I, I don't believe in diets. No, no. I will personally, my whole philosophy is really getting in tune with our bodies instead of mm. having somebody tell us what to eat. Like, keep it joyful and delicious keep it homemade, um, focus on the protein. Every single meal you're gonna have in your life from now on has got to prioritize the protein. So a pasta with tomato sauce is not food. It's not food, a salad, a salad, salad is a salad. A salad with a breast chicken on it is food. It's eggs, food. lots of eggs. Lots I of ate eggs. loads of eggs, which are really quick and easy and really delicious. Yeah, so, um, it's so cheap as well, chickpeas, beans make sure every single one of your meals you prioritize the protein really now in um, in terms of the cycle as i said the first two week, the, the first two weeks the first part of the cycle you would do well with both protein and carbs you know the body burns the, the carbs better so use that to fuel your workouts and then on the other two weeks you will be focusing a lot more on protein because progesterone is catabolizing your, your muscle and we don't want to go there building the muscle is very important to losing weight but that's the long game okay i'm not a fan of keto i'm not a fan, mm. fan of eating dull food and boring stuff um you know i follow my granny who's always cooked at home and and it was beautiful and smelly and greek and all that that's what i i i, I like more for, for and Christina, us. if I can just jump in, thank you for that, Nectaria. I was listening to this expert. This guy is called Steve, 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 
Professor Spector is his name. It sounds like, like uh, James Bond. And he wrote a book called, what's it called? Spoon Fed. And he's, he is fantastic because he's a microbiome expert and he works on twins. So he's done for King's College, they get two twins and they give them different foods and then they look at their microbiome and how they've adapted depending on what they've eaten. And he's the one who's, who's, who's I listen to constantly. And he says, no, keto is in fashion. Everything, loads of stuff is in fashion at the moment. Um, you know, there was a cauliflower or was it the cabbage soup diet? All this stuff, all those are fads. The problem with these very restrictive diets, which is I think one of the reasons why Nectaria is having a bit of a <gasps> moment is because they also tend to impact the microbiome. So the long-term impact of actually uh, withholding certain types of food from your diet is that it's likely to also imbalance your microbiome, which is a foundation of absolutely everything. Scientists don't know this yet, this is so new. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have to be a bit careful with that. And I would I would agree with both Nicola and Nectaria. Be very, very careful on, on diets like that. And I know that probably they're very good nutritionists, but have a read of Spoon Fed. His name is Tim, Tim, not Stephen, Tim Spector. I mean, it's, it, there's a lot of evidence that restrictive calorie diets and uh, change of like um, those type of what you're eating diets can have long-term detrimental impacts on your metabolism so um especially at our age calories in calories out isn't a simple equation at all so you need to think about how you're going to change your lifestyle to adapt to your body how it is um reducing sugar is always good um alcohol is another one because but just eat healthy wholesome stuff that your body will like not um highly pro so as a general rule highly processed and high in sugar bad and will always be bad <laughs> whatever you think whatever, whatever but it can be good for your mental health if you're having something you really love like churros or something like that you I know tell you, in Belgium, it's really hard <laughs> yeah amazing I mean, chocolate pancakes chocolates but good quality mm. chocolate is really good for you yeah black uh, chocolate especially. Yeah. it's yeah. really good for you i just look at this i just ate a whole bag of these all right Brazil nuts with dark chocolate organic dark chocolate chocolate's not bad for you it's the sugar if you have too much sugar but the, the belgian high quality chocolates they're outstandingly yeah, good it's just, just the quantities <laughs> yeah just watch the quantities but the thing is you wouldn't need it if you're in a balance if you're in balance what really shocked me because i've always been a total chocolate and I, i've always had some a fairly difficult relationship with food not saying i was fat or or, or really um struggled um too badly but I, I I always thought oh I deserve this and I had this kind of mental like emotional relationship now I just eat what I want like I'm in a phase of being quite tired because I've trained really hard the last two weeks and I've just listened to my body I've had a, a quite a lot to eat today I had macaroni cheese tonight <laughs> but I did put a smoked haddock in it look thanks to you uh, I um, I have taken this a little bit too lightly and thanks to you I'm going to really get more information I'm going to search her because there there seems to be a menopause center in Belgium in Brussels oh well there you go so, so maybe uh, I'm going to have a look there and see if they really have something different than the normal gynecologist because I didn't take it very seriously so far and um, Christine I uh, I've really I mean my arms became like this all of a sudden, pop. <laughs> Gosh, no, 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 no. What can I do? So, way to go. No. We can't, Christina, this, and thank you for sharing that, because we can't let us, let ourselves go like that, because it's just a downward spiral. And so we've got to fight. Unfortunately, we have to become kind of the middle-aged warriors, not warrior, warrior as in, you know, the, the fighters, because we have to go out there and we have to fight for our rights. Sounds to, like to party, no, to under, to get help. <laughs> and so it's down to us. This is why we're doing these events. It's very important, guys. And please leave your WhatsApp numbers. Join us on the Midlife Reboot Tribe. 
um, WhatsApp group because we share loads of information there. We share tidbits. The humor is fantastic, as is also all the information that we um, share with each other. Now, there's a couple of things I want to wrap up with. Are, are there any other questions? Paula, Despo, Oslem, Kinda, you've been very quiet. Hannah, Hanan, Hannah, Hanan, you've been very quiet. <laughs> yes, any questions, no. any thoughts? <clears throat> Not really, just for me, as you know, I had this slap from the universe a few weeks ago where I was, I had, um, I suddenly had this high blood pressure and I was rushed to emergency and it was like 170 over 100. Um, and it, long, long story short, I went to all, they sent me everywhere, cardiology, neurology, I don't know, ology, pathology, everywhere. And then eventually my gynecologist and my herbal doctor, who I see, who's amazing, um, uh, put it down to basically perimenopause, perimenopause go, going into menopause. Mm -hmm. Five months ago, it was perimenopause. Five months ago, I could apparently still have a baby. And what they both said, my gynecologist and my herbal doctor, told me that they've been seeing this trend of um, women, women's menopause and perimenopause being accelerated after they've been taking the vaccine. Mm. So the third vaccine specifically. Regardless of, of that, um, million tests left, right and centre. The cardiologist tried to put me on Concord and I didn't take it and I'm glad I didn't take it because I didn't need it um, but end of the day it was basically my hormones so estrogen completely dropped pro progesterone dropped um, I'd just done also creatinine what do you call it Cre creatinine 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 yeah. That, yeah so that showed that my muscle mass had uh, <laughs> turned to jelly so it was just really interesting. And then, so now for about three weeks, I've been on this, thrown onto this plant-based diet, which has been horrendously kind of like, wow, like a complete shift for me because I'm a huge meat eater. I love it. Mm. So now I've gone from, so also my, my cholesterol was a bit high, but that was also related to my lifestyle, my eating habits and all of that. And it was just really interesting because, you know, all of, all of what everybody's saying here, and Christina, thank you for being guided to me and me guided to you as well, it's just really woken me up, you know, and you just don't realize that hormones can do all of this. And I, I've been put on a lot of herbal and Ayurvedic medication or supplements, if you like. So magnesium, um, Ayurvedic things like something called Powerful Spirit for Night and uh, Ashwagandha, and I, yeah. I, I don't know, there's a whole list of them. And I have to say within the first 10 days, that brain fog that was like that has, has shrunk. I still have a bit of it, <laughs> you know, I still, it's bizarre because I feel like I can write better than I can speak. You know, when I write, I make more sense than when I speak or, or I, I, you know, I sound more, I'm more able to articulate when I write than speaking. And, and then, you know, it's like getting that balance and, and coordinating what's in here to come out at the same time. And, you know, you did, I did at one point think, oh my God, what's the matter with me? Like I was really worried. All I could think of, because I'm a single mum, was was my kids when I'm in the emergency. And it happened to me twice in a row. And both times, you know, one doctor said, yes, this is menopause. It's typical menopause. Like how can blood pressure be related to that? You know, and another doctor said to me, oh, you've got some condition and it's related to I don't know what. And I was like, okay, this is, this is going too fast. <laughs> I literally, three days of doctors. You know, and then in the end, it's, you know, you don't realize that it has such an impact. Mm. And everything that you're all talking about is exactly poorly, poorly understood. And it's, 
it's a huge thing. This women's health is a huge thing. Chop off them penises, as you said. <laughs> Whoever said it, I can't remember. <laughs> because seriously, it's not right. And well, Hanan, this is what I aim to do, especially in the Middle East. You leave that to me. You just okay. support me in getting the word out there because this is one Definitely. area. This is, the, I think, a big bastion of uh, lack of knowledge is in that area completely. I mean, we think this Europe is, is, is old school and, and traditional. Let's not even go down to what I've seen and you've experienced in, uh, in the Middle East without being rude. Amazing countries beautiful development yeah. still so much to understand about uh, women's health largely because a lot of these areas are taboo we can't even talk mm. about things like menstruation and 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 uh, and you know and women's health and vaginas pardon the v word but there you go <laughs> true, true. so thank you so much hanan and by the way i have to give you feedback you're looking a lot better than last time i saw you Thank so despite you. having that cold, whatever you're doing is working. Thank you. Thank you. It was it was COVID. <laughs> so was it? But it was good. Yeah, it was. But it's interesting because I, I really believe that that incident I had three or four weeks ago, whenever it was, um, prepared me for it because I oh literally God. had it for about four days. Mm. It, it like the symptoms and everything and then I came off meat I went on this this crash well I don't know crash but very very quick turnover into plant-based and all of the Ayurvedic um, supplements and I changed so so much of my lifestyle very very quickly isn't um, it amazing Hanan because that's what also Mr Spector said that it takes about 10 days for your microbiome to adjust so if you yeah. want just an adjustment like that, and Christina, one for you, because plant-based is another big recommendation when it comes to the microbiome, and I know that Nectaria mentioned it as well, is yes, include protein, obviously, but, but plant-based also helps. And that's one of the reasons why they say longevity is so big in, in Southern Europe as well, because we eat a lot of plants. We don't eat so much of the high-protein stuff. So another one to keep in mind, because that was also one of my um, adjustments that I made when I moved here to, to Greece, was eating a lot more. They say eat the rainbow, which I love as a, as a visual person that I am, you know, eating every colors of the rainbow and knowing that it's so fresh, because that's the beauty of living in Southern Europe, right, is you get stuff fresh from, from the farmers, mm. which is probably different in the UAE and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, in uh, <laughs> Northern Europe. Oh, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for that, Hanan, and well done for also going through the 14-day challenge, baby. Thank I'm you. Very I still proud have a couple of, of things to do on that, so yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> I was very so proud of you. Excellent, it's amazing. Love. Pardon it. me. It's amazing. I loved it. I still love it. So, and I still uh, have work to do. So, <laughs> thank you so much. I I didn't expect you to do, do it all in fourteen days, especially if you if you had COVID, which you hadn't told me. So, well done for getting that far. Excellent. So, we've got a few more minutes. I'm going to wrap up. Uh, any questions, Oslem and Kinda? I'm going to pick on you because you have said nothing, and we like to be inclusive. Talk about inclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> You Spotlight. have to go there. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I love the session. I'm loving the session. I'm just so intrigued and I'm just in awe because, and I won't take too long, but it just made me reminisce on an experience that I had. Just so just, and Oslam, this does not, Os, by the way, Oslam works with me. So Oslam, this does not go outside this call, please. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, only a couple of months ago, I decided to uh, have uh, an egg extraction procedure. So I froze my eggs and uh, th thanks for, to my mom's uh, ongoing pressure. But anyhow, um, it was a very extreme experience, no regrets at all, but it was a very extreme experience going through the 10 days of hormonal shots. Mm. Initially, I didn't feel anything for the first week and a half and until the day of the procedure I could not feel any side effects I spoke to my uh, gynecologist I told him listen I don't feel anything um, there's no water retention there's no bloat there's no weight gain apart from the the need to to the urgent need to smack any male 
that comes across from me, I don't have any other side uh, effects. And he said it wasn't too normal, but you know, one in 20 or one in 30 may have that. But what happened was that right after the procedure, everything changed. My body literally swelled up. I looked like I was six months pregnant. Uh, I was bloated. I gained four kilos of water retention. Um, and although he initially told me it would only take 48 hours and for that, and that is normal for the procedure side effects, but it took literally three weeks. And when I went back to him for the follow-up, he told me that everything will deflate and you'll go back to normal once you're, once you get your cycle. So another 10 days or so. Um, but he did recommend, and he strongly encouraged me to drink yogurt, kefir mm-hmm. and Yeah, and I really couldn't understand the whole concept of it or the rationale behind it. And he said, it will help in reducing the size of your ovaries back to normal. And for the first week and a half, I just kind of ignored it. But for the other two weeks, I drank yogurt like crazy and it literally made a world of a difference. It was like a miracle where in a week or so, I started deflating gradually. Within two days of drinking yogurt, I lost 1.5 kgs of the water retention and so on. And then, so I continued drinking it even through through my second cycle and I felt fine. I didn't experience any PMS symptoms even after two months later, no symptoms at all. So listening to the presentation today made me realize it really is about what you put in your body. And we don't, we, we do take it for granted. It doesn't hit. I mean, they t- people, everybody says it's, you are what you eat. Uh, your food is your fuel and so on, but you never really live it until you, it actually happens to you and you start seeing and feeling the difference. Um, yeah, but you, you also start need feeling the, the context, difference. Kinda. We need the context of our hormones because just saying you are what you eat is such a vacant Uh, without being exactly Exactly. you can't contextualize it but when you say your hormonal imbalance will improve as a result of what you consume (laughs) exactly yeah yeah. no but having that made me realize the link between certain foods certain food groups and the impact on hormonal imbalances because i've faced insulin resistance for at least 15 years of my life um and just realizing that linkage and, 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 and living it was a huge aha moment for me. And honestly, thank you so much. I just added spoon fed to my Amazon cart. It, it will be delivered tomorrow. So, Brilliant, Kinda. Yeah, it's great. So no, trust it. It, it's the life-changing stuff that I have come across. I, I, I've done, been doing so much reading like Nicola, like Nectaria. We've been educating ourselves like crazy. And this is the kind of stuff that's so new that science hasn't even got its head around. And that's why it's so powerful. So thank you for coming on this journey and also spreading it. But that's what this is about. And Aslan, speaking of spreading, <laughs> our Turkish representative. Well, well, thank you for our inclusion. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was a really interesting uh, session for me. And especially... Um, the exercise cycle uh, linked to the menstrual cycle really resonated with me. So it, it helped me to understand uh, my body. Actually, for a while, I am trying to listen my my body more than uh, before. So it really resonated with me. Thank you for organizing this session. It was really informative. And I think I will continue to read more about it, to learn more about my body. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Oslem, we have to tell other women about this. So please don't just keep this stuff to yourself. Educate sure. other women. Invite them to come to our every every Tuesday evening, the same time we have this, this tribe gathering. 